You know, this pandemic has led us to one of the largest bailouts of corporate America in U.S. history. Trump likes to tout that. But there was another movement that actually emerged as a result of the last financial crisis of 2008 that also led to a massive bailout of corporations, and that was the Occupy movement. And that movement came on the heels of other organizing initiatives by community-based groups trying to hold these banks accountable. And we know that in these times of crisis, uh, the corporations and the politicians are doing everything they can to make bank off the backs of the people. People get sold out, corporations get bailed out. And we have no idea the magnitude of what's going to happen through this bailout and how much more of the wealth of the people is going to be robbed by the 1%. And so the question is, is how do we continue to rise up? And Occupy was one of those movements that you know, a small ragtag group of people took action and it spread across this country and the world with lightning speed and changed the history of this country. And so as we are in this pandemic now, the question is what can we do to the same scale and with the same speed when we have to stay home? And so one of my hopes, and I'm just gonna put it out here, is like, what does it mean to strike in place? Let's not shelter in place, let's strike in place. Let's look to May Day 2020 for a general strike and let's stay home. And if we're staying home already, let's put out our signs and our messaging and social media so that they know that people are engaging in a massive collective action to refuse to participate with these systems of corporate greed and oppression. So a little, little reading out of uh, the Occupy chapter, which is called On May 12th, Occupying Wall Street and the Power of Multiplying Our Strategies and Tactics. On the morning of September 17, 2011, I hopped on the subway at 33rd Street in Manhattan and disembarked at Wall Street. I entered street level on Broadway. It was a lovely autumn day, and this was the first morning of Occupy Wall Street, a movement that would sweep the country and then the globe, but I wouldn't have guessed it then. Our initial group numbered in the dozens. By afternoon, hundreds had gathered, and by nightfall, thousands of us filled Zuccotti Park. We had become the 99%. I'd flown into New York several days prior to help train a gathering of about 50 people who were organizing in response to the advertisement printed in July by the Canadian anti-consumers group Adbusters. The call to action featured a striking image of a ballerina standing atop the iconic Wall Street Bowl and the accompanying caption, Occupy Wall Street, September 17th, bring a tent. This public call for occupation is often credited as the origins of Occupy Wall Street, but I hope to show that Occupy Wall Street was the beautiful, organic, unpredictable fruition of organizing that had been going on for several years. In truth, Occupy did not begin with the occupation of Zuccotti Park, and it did not end when the NYPD shut it down the seeds of the Occupy movement were planted during the financial crisis of 2008 and in 2009 when organizers around the country coalesced around the idea that big banks were robbing the people. And the spirit of Occupy continues today as politicians proudly call themselves socialists, as the call for free college and childcare has become mainstream, and the fight for the $15 minimum wage has made inroads in state after state. When I look back on the Occupy Wall Street time period, I don't see a single protest in a single park in New York City. I see a deeply, inextricably linked people power movement, campaigns and protests unfolding over the country and all over the world. One such campaign occurred four months before Occupy began. In some ways it made Occupy more possible. In early 2011, I worked with a consortium of labor, grassroots and community groups on a week of action called On May 12th that culminated in a march on Wall Street that was 20,000 strong. The model used by On May 12th was soon replicated by a campaign called the New Bottom Line, which carried out similar efforts in 10 cities rolling out over the fall of 2011, the same time period that Occupy encampments popped up all over the country. To my delight, folks from the New Bottom Line began working with the occupiers, Occupy Oakland, Occupy Los Angeles, Occupy Chicago, Occupy Boston, and more. This was a moment when movement made, when mainstream initiatives like the New Bottom Line leveraged the grassroots direct action efforts that occupied and vice versa. It was a fascinating time to watch the dance between the mainstream and the margins. 
When it comes to tactics, I've always advocated an all of the above approach. Multiplying our strategies and tactics means multiplying our power. We don't need to choose between civil disobedience and so-called mainstream tactics like permanent marches. We can weave all of these together, making the fabric of our resistance stronger and more beautiful. Movements are not just about winning policy victories. They are about inspiring a sense of power in the people. Movements create an embodied experience of a new paradigm. They are, in, they are a place at intersection between diverse forces with similar agenda. The autumn of 2011 was a time when movements converged, putting out a clarion call about the importance of getting corporations out of politics and putting democracy back into our daily practice. Nearly a decade later, the mission was more urgent than ever, and the creativity, compassion, and commitment of this amazing time offered lessons for today's political realities. I was in working with, in Los Angeles with the New Bottom Line, and it was the time of Occupy Wall Street, and it was a moment where, you know, tens of thousands of people were being displaced from their homes. And there was a woman, Rose Guidel, in Los Angeles, who was a member of the Service Employees International Union, who got a notice from her bank that she was going to be foreclosed and evicted. So this was an amazing moment where occupiers and community-based groups and labor union members came together. And again, I feel like it's when we are coming from all these different sectors, joining forces, that's when you know your movements really got juice and where our creativity can really, can really blossom. So occupiers in Los Angeles got involved in this fight. And it was, again, a week of action. It's this model of week of rage, week of action that I'm a big fan of and I've replicated over many years and think we need to continue. I mean, we could sure use some weeks of rage in this country right now. One of our most creative actions that week in Los Angeles was an encampment outside the 26 million Beverly, home, uh, Beverly Hills home of Stephen Mnuchin, then the head of One West Bank. This is the guy driving this financial bailout right now. Today, Mnuchin is the Secretary of the Treasury in Donald Trump's cabinet. We pulled our cars off the side of the road and walked single file up the steep hills of Bel Air to the mansion with our props, a mattress, blankets, pillows, a side table, a lamp, a rug, and a few songs. From these hills, we had a beautiful panoramic view of the city. When we reached Mnuchin's gated home, we set up our bedroom in his driveway and held up our signs, the largest which read, you take Rose's house, we take yours. The media arrived, quickly followed by the police. Our police liaison talked with the officers negotiating for more time while Rose spoke out. We then gathered our props and started back down the hill, enjoying our view every step of the way. We didn't plan to go to jail today. Wednesday brought another creative action as we converged in the Pasadena parking lot near Fannie Mae's offices. With a little rope-a-dope distraction at the security desk near the side door, we whisked in through the front door, quickly setting up our props in the lobby, a table, chairs, and a sign that read, Negotiation Table. Our intention was to negotiate with Fannie Mae representatives regarding their unethical foreclosures. We were, after all, their customers. In this, if this was a legitimate business, shouldn't they want to speak with us? Rose, her 80-year-old disabled mother, and their parish priest sat down at the table. We asked if we could speak with a Fannie Mae representative regarding Rose's mortgage, but instead they sent the police who arrived along with the media. The folks in the lobby were on the phone with the people in the offices upstairs, and for a moment we thought they might actually send someone down. They did not. Instead, the police arrested Rose, her mother, the priest, and two allies. Along with these arrests came our media exposure of our campaign. The next day was our big day in downtown Los Angeles, which was now co-sponsored by SEIU and Occupy Los Angeles. Within just a week, Occupy had become a really important player. The occupiers were pretty green when it came to marches and street actions, while um, ACE, and uh, SEIU had lots of experience. This was a great opportunity for the union folks to teach occupiers if they were too about taking the streets. It was a beautiful sunny day in LA and the streets were our domain. Working in teams, our two marches flowed out in different directions, each part of the march with its own tactical team and a list of targets to visit along the way. 
As we neared the intersection of 7th Street and Figueroa, a third team took over Bank of America's lobby, holding up a giant banner calling for repayment of the billions of dollars that Bank of America owed the American people. As the Bank of America action called chaos on the corner, caused chaos on the corner, I called our sound truck guy who was waiting down the block and said, now! He slowly moved the truck into the intersection as we began to fill in around it, blocking off incoming traffic in all directions. A group of union activists and occupiers began sitting, blocking the intersections. And just like that, we had occupied both the intersections and the bank. Right then, John O'Shafer, a brilliant strategist and good friend from my Justice for Janitor days, called down to me from the back of the sound truck. The call rose and they're going to renegotiate her loan. The eviction and foreclosure were off. Holy shit, we did it. We hugged one another just as the riot police mobilized. We quickly got Rose up on the truck to tell everyone the good news. The crowd exploded with cheers and a dance party broke out right there and then. The police backed off and let us have our celebration. And after about 10 minutes, we wrapped up our street blockade, called for others to join the fight. And again, we had only just begun.